Um, all right, so uh, let's get started with our uh, talks for today. Our first one is from Dr. Jingjing Ye. Um, she received her PhD degree in statistics from UC Davis, and she currently works at Beijing. She's the global head of data science and operational excellence um, with global statistics and data sciences there. She has over 16 years of experience in both ph the pharmaceutical industry and also at the FDA. Um, and her focus has been in cancer drug discovery and development. Um, her statistical and regulatory experience also expands the full spectrum on patients' treatment journeys, right from diagnosis, treatment, and then living with the condition. Um, so with that, I'll give it over to Dr. Yi, and hopefully this will be a really informative talk. Thank you. Thank you. I want to really thank the ISA statistics section to invite me, to give me this opportunity to, uh, to share and introduce the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, let me start to share my slides. Can everybody see that? Yes. Okay, thank you. So I think, you know, as I look through these, um, the audience list, um, you know, it seems like we have a mixed audience, um, but I think I prepared this for more as an introduction slice for those who are new to learn about drug development and the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, I'm sure we'll have a lot more interactions um, after we, uh, all the speaker finish the talk. And, you know, so we can gear towards answering those questions for those mid-career and or seasoned professionals. Um, as I think you already heard my bio, but as you know that I transitioned from pharma to FDA, then back to pharma, and my experience expanding from preclinical, non-clinical to clinical trial and all the other areas, which I'm going to share with you now. I'm sure you've heard the, um, the famous quote by Benjamin Desrail, there's three types of lies, um, you know, lies, damn lies, and statistics. But to counter that, I think, you know, the, um, the famous and most influential statistician in the 21st, uh, 20th century, also the founding chairman of Harvard Statistics Department, uh, Fred uh, Mostella, also countered, it is easy to lie with statistics, but easier to lie without them. And I think, you know, that couldn't be more true uh, when the drug development discovery and development is based on the principle called evidence-based medicine, which you can see on the screen that is right in the center and at the intersection between the basic research evidence and what the literature says was the bench uh, research and then the clinical experience, which the treating physicians uh, knows about the drug and, and the, the disease. And also the other circle is the patient values, what the patient actually want for treating their disease and uh, um, for, for the drugs. So then to go straight into that, um, you know, drug development, discovery and development is a long process. So I think, you know, at the bottom of the slides, you can see a uh, time, uh, uh, time horizon basically showing the, the, the timeline from discovery to the non-clinical, preclinical development to go through the clinical um, trials and then getting to approval post-marketing. And these figures are from our earlier, trial, uh, earlier paper in published in 2004. And then, but these are general uh, timeline, uh, the stages of the drug di discovery and, um, and development. So then in terms of statistics support, it is in fact on, along every step of the way. So then the first stage of the drug discovery and preclinical, non-clinical development, those are typically is the preclinical, non-clinical statistics support. As I, we move from the, the non-clinical, non, uh, preclinical stage into human development, that is where the clinical comes in, you need to have drug products, right? So then you need to be able to manufacture the drug product that's for the patient to be able to, to take. So then the manufacturing portion comes into play. So those are specialty area within the, the pharmaceutical industry, and that expands throughout the clinical development and uh, well into the post-marketing areas. And then once the drug uh, gets into the humans, and that's the clinical development that typically have the, the uh, phase one, two, three, and phase four. Phase one, two, three is the pre-marketing. You know, I don't want to get the, the nuances for that, but then those are typically we call the clinical trial, the clinical statistics support. And those are different methodologies and you know, things to, to be considered for that. 
And then the drug doesn't stop when it's hit on the market. So there's going to be post-marketing. By requirement, there are going to be some other specific post-marketing studies, but there are a lot more beyond just the clinical studies for statistic support. And I bucket them all into the life cycle statistic support, which you will be able to hear that in the next few slides. And because we have regulatory statistician here, so where does that intersection comes into play? I'm sure you will hear a lot more from Sarisha later, but then just to know that, you know, the, um, the regulatory, the uh, timeline hits into well in, in this drug development process. So once you know it's past the clinical preclinical testings, the IND will be filed, which is saying that we have a new potential drug that's coming into the clinical trial development into humans. And then after development stage, and we're showing the drug is actually uh, safe and efficacious, uh, efficacious showing the enough evidence to show it's efficacious and if NDABLA will be uh, filed and under review by FDA that is in USA and then there's the um, and then go through all the review cycle hit on the market. With that uh, a newer uh, reference, which this paper is published in the 2019, and this gives a, lot, uh, a different perspective on how the drug development is currently in the um, pharma industry. So it is right now, it's a very um, expensive industry now. For every new drug, currently estimation of it needs to cost US dollar somewhere between 1.5 to $2 billion. And then it starts with this, um, you know, 5,000 to 10,000 potential compounds in the preclinical, in the, in the stage, in the drug discovery. And then into the testing preclinical phase, and this comes down to 200, roughly 250 compounds. And before it hits to the human trials, they're coming down to only five compounds. And then went through phase, uh, phase one, two, three trial, uh, trials and then gets to the deaths on the FDA and that's coming down to really one approved drugs out of this many candidates. And then the, the most expense and time consuming portion is in the clinical trial phase. And then the most, um, you know, the majority of that span is the confirmatory stage where it's the, typically it's the phase three trial. So every step of the way, it is data rich, as you can see, because that's evidence-based. So that's where the statistics come into play. But just to make things a little bit more complicated, uh, I'm showing this again uh, from another angle. Um, this is directly is the, um, the from the drtarget.com. Um, I want to give them credit really showing this fantastic visuals, showing what is really uh, coming down on the pipeline from really an idea drug target all the way down to actual drug that can cure disease. So those are the stages, as you can see from left to right, and that's all the stages we already mentioned. Prior to the, the phase one trial, there's going to be the pre, uh, the pre clinical non-clinical non testing stage. There are going to be target ID, target validation, target selections to the lead when they get into a candidate, which actually can be made into a, um, an actual drug compound and then testing in the hu uh, in the in the animals and then gets into the humans and every step of the way there are statistics guiding it through and then that's here's the attrition uh, or failure rate every step is uh, the input of the pre uh, the output is the input of the next stage so then those are the the, the failure rate along the line so then I'm just going to break it down as an introduction for each step um, a little bit more. So really the first step one is actually is still a target. A very early stage, which is the first stage, which did we have a um, potential based on the basic research, bench research, there can be potential a uh, drug target. And you need to really work with uh, cross-functional different um, background teams to um, search the literature. Some, you know, if there's a biomarkers, then there are bioinformatics come into play. And there's an iterative process that's in between. You know, you, you, you see if that's the, the potential compound can be designed based on that, and uh, which drug target uh, that is more relevant to that disease. And then there's, you know, other previous evidence based on the animals, based on the lab data, you know, you can show that's actually Actually can potentially work. And then the next stage is to the target to lead. And that's the, as I mentioned before, the previous 
uh, you know, uh, output is the input for the next stage. So then this stage, you're gonna search, you know, uh, as a compound potential, how can we design a compound, a drug, so that can target that potential target. And that you can easily go into millions of data points and can be different combinations. So then you can, you know, uh, go through different various testing uh, in the labs on the, on the, um, on these, um, you know, play-based or non-clinical testing that you need to know they are, how potent they are, how stable they are, you know, um, can we change the design to make it more potent, more potentially, um, you know, efficacious to show uh, and then safer. Uh, based on different, um, you know, characteristic for that compound, that, that potential compound itself. And then next stage, you you have a potential um, drugs. Now we need to know how exactly is testing for its efficacy, and it's you know so that that's where it's the, the testing stage comes into play. The, you know those that you have a lead molecular, and you need to based on the the testing results uh, modify that and to make that into really a candidate molecules. And then, and then based on the animal testing further to make into an actual drug that human can actually take. So those are some of the data and evidence you need based on statistics and modelings. You know, you need to know the drug efficacy in the animal models, and you need to know the, the, um, the, the pharmacokinetics, how the, basically the, the drug is absorbed, uh, you need to eliminate and how the pharmacodynamics, basically how the, the drug is doing uh, within the body and then how the toxicity, the safety portion of that is, is there anything that we need to pay attention or adjust the molecular to, to be less toxic when it actually gets into the humans. And then the stage where it takes the longest and, you know, um, and it requires a lot more testing is the human um, stage, the clinical development, phase one, two, three. The phase one is typically first in humans, and you know, that needs to check an adverse effect in human, um, you know, healthy humans. Oncology is the different stories. And then, you know, that's requires smaller, um, you know, patient um, populations to really testing for that. But then as it gets to, to the phase two and to phase three, then, you know, we require a lot more testings and, and the patient size is, is typically more. And you need, really need to have a confirmatory setting when it gets into the phase three before the drug approval to show that it is the, the, uh, you have really strong evidence showing that it's, it's uh, safe and effectiveness to get it passed to, um, to the, really the FDA and then making sure that it can get some from the market. And as I mentioned, it doesn't stop when the drug actually gets approved. There's the other interesting life cycle. Um, I call it life cycle support which is at the development stage, there's already other support that you can do based on statistics. Those include like understanding standard of care, like what are typically used uh, within different regions, you know, a patient take, uh, if there's nothing new on the market and then uh, what, what a patient are taking as a standard of care for that disease. And that's going to influence your comparator arm, you know, your trial designs, and then you also can search where can we recruit those patients? And uh, we are the high prevalence, you know, within the, the, each region, within each disease area, you know, which, uh, you know, even in, inside the United States, which center has the most expertise? Patients go there and to, to get their, um, you know, disease uh, treated. And then what are the disease bur burdens? So then that's the, really the treatment pattern. So how severe you categorize those disease and for earlier stage versus late stage and you must, the disease level severity is different. You may, you know, consider different kind of treatment. And uh, once that gets strong to the market, there's a, uh, from a, a pharmaceutical industry perspective, is gets on the growth phase because they can, uh, you know, officially sell the drug on the market, and they they really need to know a lot more about you know how the drug does than um, a smaller limited patient population within the clinical development. So as you you can think, you know, the patients who can enroll into a clinical trial is still a relatively smaller percentage than the whole patient population that can potentially be benefit from that drug. So then once that actually hits onto the market, there's a lot more other 
growth phase, you need to understand how that drug does. That can be like the post-marketing commitment, that can be the real world studies, and the, how the, the prescribing patterns is, so how the doctor is actually prescribing that drug when it hits on the market, and the utilization pattern. And, you know, and the long term, you know, clinical outcomes, and those can be based on different regions and, the, you know, different uh, regions interested at different clinical outcomes. And it, it can be, you know, if there are several drugs actually gets on the market treating the same disease, that's especially true in cancers, you know, how is the head head comparative effectiveness is, and that is based on the uh, interest from the insurance company so they, they always want to reimburse the best performing drug, but that typically had to have comparison within the same drug, the same class of drug or for the different drug on the, in the same indication that isn't really typically available there. So re you really need to think about alternative ways to show head to head comparative effectiveness when there's multiple drugs treating the same disease on the market. And then is there any differentiating factors that's for different subpopulations? This can be based on different, um, you know, age, like uh, older, older group that's you know, older than 75 per, uh, age, years of age versus uh, uh, a younger older generation, which, which is 60 to 75, they may be, you know, showing different efficacies or like, you know, some other, um, you know, renal impaired population, things like that you need to understand. And then there's can be usage difference that can be influenced by other things like that. And then since I just touch upon some of the manufacturer, because you really need to making sure you are manufactured a drug and is the, the drug is supposedly, you know, manufactured the same type of drug with the same active uh, drug substance that's the patient is taking the same drug over and over again so really making sure the manufacturer of that drug is performing the same across time so those are the examples some of the visual the statistics you'll be able to help our manufacturer side of the colleagues those can be like process stabilities process monitorings there isn't any drift in in their um, performance of, about the, the drug for uh, the active component of that drug uh, over time and then you can set that like the control limit specification, things like that. And it's, I think, you know, I, I've introduced to um, a general uh, type of different areas for pharmaceutical industry. And then as you can think, you know, because this is section for um, consulting, you absolutely is working with a lot of different cross disciplining groups. So those are the, the typical groups that a statistician in pharma industry can work with. And these are more geared towards uh, preclinical, non-clinical. This can include like bench scientists, computational chemistry, computational biology, drug safety, animal studies, preclinical pharma pharmacology, pharma pharmacotoxicity, and these are more geared towards the clinical trial phase. You work with medical doctors, investigators, data management, programming, clinical pharmacologists, pharmacometrics, pharmacovisualists, those are the safety, clinical operations who are actually on the, on the ground running the trial, making, making sure the data is collected on time and accurately, medical writing, regulatory affairs, if that goes into the, the uh, different regions for approval, and qualities, because you know, those are the quality group making sure we are you know, supply the right amount of drugs to the right patient on time and things like that. And then these are more geared towards post approval. So those can be medical affairs, from safety, continual safety monitoring, because there should be a lot more pool of uh, patients that taking the drug, there can be commercial, marketing, health outcome, manufacturing, and formulation. When the drug is approved for like a tablet that you're taking orally, but then it can change to some other forms of, of the drug, like uh, by IV, by uh, sub-Q injections, those are the things, you know, that the, for the same drug, but then they can make into a different formulations. If this is uh, typical for a pediatric younger generation, uh, you know, patient potentially can take the drug. They cannot just take the big tablet and they need to be taken into a more liquid form. So these are the different, uh, you know, group that of, of folks you'll be working with as in the pharmaceutical industry. And I'm saying this as a statistician, but we also welcome data scientists because they have a different expertise. And both PhD and master level statistician can and play different roles into these different um, areas. So I think, you know, I hope I, by this introduction, you know, pharmaceutical industry is a really data rich industry with diverse and interesting topic on 
different stage within the drug development, discovery and development stage uh, as a statistician. And I think also that, as you all heard about the uh, John Tukey's quote, that the best thing about being a statistician is that you get to play in everyone's backyard. I think by hope, I hope by showing you this, it is absolutely true that you can, we can play in everybody's backyard in the pharmaceutical industry. And that's all, thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Uh, once again, so if anyone has questions, please put them in the chat below so we can get all our speakers to answer them at the end. Um, thank you, Dr. Yi. Um, it was really nice to see like, sort of the, the different stages of drug development and where statistics fits in. Um, so thank you very much for your perspective. All right, um, so we'll now move on to our next speaker who is Dr. Aparna Anderson. Um, she received her bachelor's in applied math from UC Davis and her master's and PhD in biostatistics from uh, the University of uh, Washington. Uh, she, before she worked in industry, uh, Dr. Anderson was a assistant professor in the division of biostatistics at University of Minnesota. And then in her 24 years as a clinical trialist, she has worked as a chief scientific officer at WCG Statistics Collaborative, and also as a group director at uh, Bristol Myers Squibb. Um, she's currently at the Bill and Melinda Gates Medical Research Institute, um, and they focus on advancing uh, different drugs and vaccines against a variety of diseases, uh, essentially advancing it from the lab into human studies. Um, so I'm really looking forward to your unique perspective, Dr. Anderson. Thank you so much, Samita. So it, can you see my screen and can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah. Great, okay. So um, hi everyone, um, thank you for the introduction. I'll be telling you a little bit about working at uh, a contract research organization or CRO. So um, I'll go through my background really, really quickly. Um, Samita just went over it. So I'll just run through it quickly um, and just show you um, all of the different roles I had subsequent to um, getting a degree in math and then the postgraduate degrees in biostatistics. So what I'm going to be um, fo focusing on for today's presentation is, is I'm going to be drawing from my experiences working at uh, Statistics Collaborative, um, where I was for the last five years up until um, the end of last year. Um, and I was a statistical consultant and a project lead for the various statistical services um, that the group um, and this group is a it's a niche vendor that that offers a range of statistical services for clinical trials. Um, so Jing Jing sort of covered a lot of what goes into a clinical trial. Um, so to understand what a CRO does, it's helpful to really appreciate all of the different disciplines or sort of areas of expertise that go into planning and executing um, clinical trials. And so you know you have the clinical oversight through medical monitoring. There's the statistical piece, which is what you know, we all do. Um, then there's the regulatory team that li liaises with health authorities such as the FDA. Um, there's an operational component that's very complicated. There's a group that interfaces with all of the investigative sites. And then there's data management that designs the database and makes sure that the data are clean and complete. And then you have other areas such as a project manager and medical writing and pharmacovigilance and other teams. So a biotech company or a pharmaceutical company that's sponsoring a clinical trial um, might outsource any of these functions um, to an external CRO, a CRO or a vendor. And by pulling in a CRO, the company has the benefit of supplementing its resources and extending the expertise and reach for conducting complex studies. So for the statistical function specifically, um, the outsourced services might include um, the statistical analysis plan. And this is a really critical regulatory document that pre-specifies all of the analyses that will be conducted um, to address the study hypotheses. Partnered with the statistical analysis plan is um, a data presentation plan that shows the mock-ups of how the analyses will be formatted and displayed in the final study report. Outsour outsourced services also uh, includes, typically includes statistical programming, and that's often done in SAS. 
And this includes the final analyses that go into the study report. Um, companies are also obligated to provide um, regular safety reporting to health authorities. And so uh, an outsourced group um, at a CRO might, might support that activity. And then another really critical activity for many studies is um, the safety oversight that independent data monitoring committees are engaged to provide. So those committees need to review cumulative reports while a study is ongoing. And so there's a need for an independent statistical reporting group to provide those reports to such a committee. And that activity is often outsourced. So the process for choosing a CRO starts with a request for proposals or the RFP process um, that the sponsor company sends out to uh, a select uh, list of vendors. So the RFP includes the details of the study and the specific scope of activities for a given functional area. So a vendor on that list then submits a bid that shows a budget proposal for performing the tasks. So that proposal will have individual line items that show the cost of each discrete task, which is usually tied to the role of the person at the CRO who's going to be performing that task and that person's hourly billing rate. So for, for the CRO bids that, that make the short list, so the company reviews all the bids and they, they, they create a short list, the company then will invite the CRO to a bid defense where the CRO then has the opportunity to describe its capabilities and depth of experience in a lot more detail. And the sponsor company might, uh, you know, they usually negotiate some of the costs and then they ultimately award the work to a vendor. So what is the typical career path at a CRO for a statistician? Um, it's helpful first to understand that at biotech and pharmaceutical companies, usually um, the, the, the companies want the statistical role to be filled by PhD level statisticians. Um, there are exceptions, but for the most part at a biotech or pharma company, a master's degree in statistics will provide career opportunities on the programmer track, not necessarily on the statistician track. In contrast at a CRO, um, there are statistician positions where master's degrees are sufficient. However, the entry level will naturally be different for somebody coming out of school with a master's degree versus a PhD. So the typical track for a master's level candidate joining a CRO would be biostatistician one, biostatistician two, and then moving to senior and principal statistician, and then to director and senior director. And typically a person is in a given role for two to three years before promotion to the next level. So senior directors usually have 10 or more years of experience. Um, the entry level roles of Biostat 1 um, and then some into Biostat 2 typically are more programming focused, um, starting out with um, you know, creating sort of basic programs and mapping out uh, the displays for analyses through the table shell preparation. Um, as somebody moves into more senior roles, the responsibilities will become more statistically technical with respect to the types of programming responsibilities. And then they'll also start becoming involved in drafting the statistical analysis plan on behalf of the sponsor. And then the senior roles, um, uh, oh, I should say that, that in the middle role, you start to begin to manage the teams with respect to resource planning so that some of the project management pieces start to become um, part of the, the, the list of responsibilities. And then going to director and senior director level, the accountability goes up even further. And there's much more um, oversight of, of the CRO's delivery to the sponsor company. And there's more involvement in, in inter interacting with the clients. So what is different about working at a CRO versus a biotech or pharmaceutical company. A key difference between the two settings arises from the sponsor versus non-sponsor roles. So um, 
Jingjing Jing touched on this. So the, so the biotech pharma company is always the sponsor of a clinical trial. And so in the US, that means that the sponsoring company owns what's called the IND, which stands for the Invest Investigational New Drug Designation. And what that means then for the statistician working on the sponsor side is that that person will be more directly involved over time in the strategic aspects of drug development. So in more concrete terms, that means that the sponsor statistician will gain a depth of clinical and regulatory understanding in a given disease area, um, will contribute to the clinical development strategy, will engage in meetings with health authorities such as the FDA and EMA, They'll be involved in creating the key regulatory documents, such as the protocol, charters, statistical analysis plans, and the clinical study reports. And at some point, the sponsor statistician will be a co-author on publications coming out of the studies. The CRO statistician's role has some overlap with what a sponsor statistician might do with respect to execution, but the CRO statistician won't necessarily have that direct involvement in strategy. It's, it's a little bit more of an arm's length relationship. Instead, because the CRO business model focuses on building a clientele to provide clinical trial services, the statistician's role in the CRO has a, some, some different features as compared to the sponsor side. So for example, the CRO statistician will gain a broad range of technical experience because of simultaneously supporting a lot of different clients at once. And this might include working across different phases of clinical trials. So you might at the same time be working with one client in early phase, another in late phase, another in post-marketing. Um, you, you'll get experience working in different disease areas at the same time. And whether a disease is acute or chronic or life-threatening often translates into very different statistical designs and endpoint considerations. The nature of the work can also be quite varied in a CRO setting. It might be a long-term uh, relationship with a client where the support goes from planning through execution and then regulatory submission, or it might be a very you know, discrete, short-term ad hoc sort of consulting task. As in a legal firm, um, billable hours have to be kept track of. So the statistician will keep track of those billable hours in timesheets so that clients can be invoiced. And um, the CRO statistician will uh, often be on the front line of business development activities that feed into the RFP process that I described earlier. So this gives a very high level flavor of what a CRO statistician's role is. And, um, I'll stop there and hand it back over to Sunita and Andrea. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. That was uh, really informative, especially sort of the comparison between CRO versus pharma. Thank you. Um, all right. So with that, we move on to our last speaker, um, who is Dr. Sirisha Mushti. Um, she received her master's in statistics from the Central University of Hyderabad in India after which she worked as a statistician at GSK Pharmaceuticals in India. She then received her PhD in statistics from Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, she's been working at the FDA since then, um, and she's in the Office of Biostatistics at the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, uh, and they support the Division, division of Oncology, so they, reg they help regulate oncology product, approvals for gastrointestinal diseases, melanomas, and other advanced skin cancers. Um, I see that you started sharing a screen, so go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes. I can. Oh, perfect. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Sarisha Mushti, and thank you, Samida, for the introduction. Uh, so my previous speakers have given a very nice introduction of how the clinical um, trial development or even the drug development process works. And I'm here to provide a regulatory perspective of what goes on when these submissions come to FDA for, uh, to support for approval or even like at the protocol development stage. So
Okay, here's my panel disclaimer. And just to begin with, I wanted to give you an introduction of what sort of positions are available at FDA. So again, as uh, Dr. Anderson has mentioned, we, ha we also have like two tracks based on your education qualification. For those who had a PhD in statistics, we hired them into this mathematical statistician role, uh, which is more, um, who are like more responsible to perform the review of IND or the protocols or even the NDAs that Dr. Jingjing has mentioned. Um, so the terminology here, like the title might differ based on your immigration status. That's what I just like um, mentioned it's either they'll be called as staff fellow or visiting associate if they are not citizens of US. Otherwise, um, their job responsibilities typically say the same, uh, irrespective of what you are called as uh, the title. And the other track is uh, those who have masters in statistics, they will be hired into this data analyst role. I'll come to it in a bit, but. Um, so all these job announcements, uh, they are typically made in USA jobs and even they are posted in the FDA websites also, uh, which are like open to public and uh, anyone who's interested, they can go into these um, FDA website or USA jobs and check for the available positions. There was a question of when these announcements will be made. So I just wanted to make clear that there's no specific time as such, but it is all like need based. Um, if there are any new positions uh, are opened up or if we have someone moving out and have those positions available there. So here's a quick outline of what I'm gonna do. For those who are like new to the uh, drug development process and to FDA, I just wanted to give a very brief introduc introduction of FDA here. Um, then I'll present like what are the responsibilities of a statistician at OB, OB's Office of Biostatistics in CEDAR. Um, and again, what are the opportunities uh, that they have in addition to their primary job responsibilities uh, when they are working at FDA? So what we actually do at FDA. So FDA is a regulatory agency that regulates many products related to public health such as uh, foods, cosmetics, dietary supplements, tobacco products, and even like the medicines. And the regulatory objective might differ slightly based on the type of product we are handling here. So for example, if you're looking at cosmetics, dietary supplements, and food, um, then the primary objective here is to ensure that they are safe to use. But if you consider like the medical, prod uh, medical products, like more geared towards the treatment of patients like drugs or vaccines or biological products, medical devices. So the objective is not only to assess their safety, but also how effective these new drugs are. And all of FDA's actions are guided by code of federal, re federal regulations. Just a very brief introduction of what, um, how the acts and amendments come into the picture when uh, that guides FDA here. So history of FDA like goes back to early 1900s where the first regulation related to food and drugs uh, called the Pure Foods and Drugs Act was implemented in the year 1906. This act helped prohibit the interstate business of adulterated and misbranded food and drugs. Then came the Food and Drug uh, Cosmetics Act in 1938. This new law brought cosmetics and medical devices under control, like under regulation um, policies. And it required that drugs be labeled with adequate directions for safe use. With the 1962 amendment, the requirement of substantial evidence of effectiveness was implemented. So mainly this is what drives like when, um, when the NDA is being submitted to show this substantial evidence of effectiveness. And where we are located, FDA, this is the, this is like one of the few campuses owned by the government and this is a FDA headquarters. We call it as White Oak Campus. There are other locations present in, in, uh, in Maryland and in the US, but not as large as this one, so. And this campus is just like 20 minutes away from DC um, on a no traffic day. <laughs> Coming to the FDA organizational structure. So FDA is an agency within the Department of Health and Human Services and consists of nine uh, 
center level organizations at a very high level. This is the FDS organization structure, and I'll provide you a drop down as where Office of Biostatistics that I work in is located, and what are the different divisions within OB that hires statisticians. So here at CEDAR, um, Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, this ensures like safe and effective drugs available to improve public health. And here is a simplified version of CEDAR organization here. And within CEDAR, again, we have a couple of offices and Office of Biostatistics here is located under Office of Translation, Translation Sciences. Coming to Office of Biostatistics, this is our uh, organization cha um, chat here of the Office of Biostatistics, and we have nine divisions here based, and they're like divided based on the therapeutic area that they are handling. And within each division, you'll see like multiple teams that are typically formed to align clinical divisions within Office of uh, New Drugs. Um, there are approximately like 400 statisticians uh, with a PhD degree under Office of Biostatistics. As I mentioned at the very beginning about the positions available within OB, so the mathematical statisticians are placed within like a particular team uh, in a division to perform the review activities. And very rarely, I should say that we get a chance to review um, for other teams or across divisions. When it comes to topic-based research projects, this entire group is like considered as one big pool and anyone with an experience or interest can get involved in that research. So at those times, we get to interact with other division members and we get to work across divisions. So now the other position I mentioned is the data analyst for those with master's degree. Uh, data analyst positions are located either in OTL, like which is one level higher than uh, Office of Biostatistics, or even within bios, uh, uh, Office of Biostats, we have this analytics and information uh, informatics staff. They hire the data analyst, and data analysts like they get to play the role of a consultant sometimes for um, one of these teams or for a division, or even like for a entire division, mainly to support with the research projects. Um, typically, data analysts, they won't get involved with the review work, but mostly get towards like the uh, programming uh, support or for the uh, research support. And recently, many vacancy, uh, vacancies opened up for this position. So look out for those in, uh, announcements, those who are interested. Um, responsibilities. So, what are the responsibilities of a mathematical statistician? Uh, of course, we over, overlap with opportunities that you have on industry side also, like on a pharma side also. However, the first four bullets here uh, list what is specific, like very specific to regulatory statisticians. Among this, the first and foremost is you have to understand the key laws and regulations and able to apply them while you are performing statistical reviews to evaluate uh, drug development, drug safety, and effectiveness. Again, the landscape is changing um, very fast, I should say, in recent times. And as it changes, new policies and guidance documents will be developed. And these guidance documents are the source. Um, like the CEDAR uses these guidance documents to disseminate this policy to outside FDA, uh, to the entire community uh, here. So. We as statisticians, like in a regulatory setting, we will have that chance to involve with this guidance development and get to be a part of this whole development process also. Uh, research the statistical issues relevant to drug regulation. So even on the pharma side, you, you, are, you may get like involved with the research depending on the position you are um, handling, but for the statisticians on a regulatory side, the research is more geared towards like a critical um, review of the statistical methodology that they're existing. So we got to understand not only just the advantages of the method, but we have to like make sure that there are no issues um, once we implement those research on um, those uh, statistical methodologies. So there, so that's 
one aspect where the regulated statisticians have to focus more um, compared to all other statisticians apart uh, outside the regulatory setting. And again, these four uh, sets here, I think they're pretty much same across the um, different platforms, I should say, like even if you're in a, a pharmaceutical side or on a regulatory setting, uh, statisticians will get to involve with the advisory committee meetings. Um, so for those who don't know about this advisory committee meetings, these are like the public meetings held by FDA um, and these are used to obtain like independent expert advice on scientific, technical and policy matters. And as a statistician in the Office of Biostat, we get to like prepare for these meetings or even like present at these meetings, depending on the topic at discussion. The other, uh, the other three items that I listed here, I think it's pretty much same um, with the other um, platforms also. So we get to involve and uh, with the scientific meetings and conferences, we happen to uh, attend them and present at these scientific meetings, whatever the findings we have like during performing our um, job, like the work. And we do have the chance of like having continue, uh, continue our professional development. And again, one another aspect of statistician is as Dr. Jing Jing, Jing, Jing mentioned, um, we get to play a role in everyone's backyard. So <laughs> as a team at FDA, we get involved with discussions with the several like different multiple, uh, multiple disciplines and we try to like teach them some of the non um, teach them some of the statistical concepts to them and also like we mentor like new reviewers also and i think jinji already touched upon this this is just a glimpse of how it works um for statisticians and they have to like get involved with this multidisciplinary team and having your voice heard is very important i should say so from your communication skills to effectively explain those concepts to non-statistical audience is always the key uh, aspect. So the next few slides, uh, these have like more specific details of what I mentioned in my previous slide that listed the responsibilities and opportunities and also um, both Dr. Jing Jing um, and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Apam Anderson has touched upon specific aspects of developing the statistical analysis plan um, and also pretty much it's a reputation, but, but only one aspect that differs those who are working in a regulatory set, um, setting compared to those in the pharma side is unlike statisticians in the pharma company who are like actively involved throughout the de drug development process, the regulatory statisticians, uh, they'll be involved at the early stages of clinical development, um, what we call here as the IND. Um, so the study protocols will be submitted under IND before the study is initiated. And we get to review these protocols to cover the aspects that are listed here and provide some critical comments and uh, feedback based on the study design there. In addition to the NDA review, will be like more heavily involved once the study is completed and submitted to FDA to support the approval. So these submissions are called as um, new drug applications or even like the biological license applications. The next part is uh, the post-marketing safety review. Statisticians would get involved in this also, but, the, uh, but within FDA, we have like a separate division that handles this post-marketing safety review and um, Mainly it's geared towards how safe these drugs are in a post-marketing uh, setting there. So I think I already discussed briefly about this advisory committee meeting. So I'm gonna skip these here. Um, again, guidance and policy development, as I mentioned, Cedar guidance documents are the primary source of policy disseminations. And we, as a statistician in Office of Biostatistics, we get to <clears throat> play the role of uh, leadership 
for many of these guidances and also like contribute to guidances led by other officers also, not just by the Office of Biostat. We have like many other offices where, um, where these guidance documents will be developed uh, by research opportunities. This is a very interesting part. I mean, uh, so most of you may have heard like as a statistician in the regulatory setting, the primary responsibility is to like perform the reviews, but we end up like doing a lot of research also. So many interesting like statistical problems motivated by regulatory science. Um, and also, and also we often end up like in many research projects driven by the submissions that include new statistical methodologies and the issues that we also like come across when we are reviewing these sub uh, submissions. Depending on one's personal interest, you may even get involved more in these research projects after working for some time at FDA. This provides the opportunity to collaborate both internally and externally to with um, they like pharma and even like some of the academics also. We also have some intern programs like RSR and ORISE that provide good opportunities to recruit students to work on some of the research projects and the students will be mentored by the OB statisticians here. Again, as, as I mentioned, we uh, statisticians in regulatory setting, they do have the opportunity to teach and mentor and take up the leadership role. Benefits, of course, many of you have, may have heard like the benefits that you have with the federal agencies, um, like the uh, additional benefits in the job security. Uh, we do have like wide support for maintaining a work-life balance here. They do allow some of the flexible working schedule and workplace uh, arrangements also. Um, so given all this, what I actually like the most is the importance of the work that you do here. You are driven by a mission of public safety, public health. Um, we get to like collaborate across disciplines and the diversified, uh, you get to like work on a very diversified topics and have the different responsibilities of being a mentor as a statistical review. And we do have this integration of regulatory scientific and statistical issues also. Here are just few links for your additional information on some of the topics that I just touched upon. And this is just one article from our previous director of Office of Biostatistics that, that's really like motivating for, <laughs> for recent graduates to see like what is the role of statisticians in regulatory decision-making. With that, I'll stop my presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Mushki. Um, it was really nice hearing about the different career opportunities of the FDA. Um, okay, so with that, I wanna just thank all three of our speakers again, um, and I will hand it over to David for some questions. Thank you, Samita. Um, so due to our time, I will just start by looking at some of the questions that the speakers are yet to answer. Uh, so the first one which would go for all of our speakers is what statistical modeling approach is mostly applied in drug development and pharmaceutical industry? So um, in any order, yeah. Okay. So uh, very broad st <laughs> <laughs> Statistics methodology approaches, is that a question? Yeah, statistical modeling approaches, like what statistical methods uh, typically okay. used. Right. I think, you know, those because uh, all three of us actually in a clinical development stage, because those are actually divided into different set of duty areas. Um, I can just give in the time. I think, you know, for example, like survival is, is heavily used in the, um, in the in the cancer drug clinical development. But there's other um, methodologies that will be geared more towards other therapeutic areas, um, you know, and, and also other type of uh, approaches that's going to be depend on different like drug discovery stage, bioinformatics, those will be including those uh, machine learnings, AI methodologies as well, so. Yeah, I would say that, you know, coming out of a biostat program, you'll get the breadth of exposure, I think, with coursework. 
um, you know, that's typically needed for, you know, an entry level statistician position. If you're coming out with a sort of master's in public health, you might have to seek out courses in like survival analysis or um, longitudinal analyses. You know, these are these are things that are sort of um, bread and butter methods. You know, um, mixed modeling approaches and methods for handling missing data. So, if you're coming from a sort of not a pure biostat program, you might have to seek out those more biostat facing um, statistical courses. Yeah. So, okay, I call my other co speakers. Um, comments here. One thing I would say is if if you're doing your um, course in biostatistics, then pretty much you'll get all the basic education that's required to get into this drug industry development process. But but if you're not like from a biostatistics team, like concentration there, I can give you my own example. I came from a mathematical statistician background, but for me to understand this drug development process, I probably it just took me like three to four months at max to understand how things develop here. It's a transition, it's a bridging that you have to do once you get into the drug development um, uh, process here. But other than that, I I guess you're pretty much um, trained to. Uh, understand like what methods will be used there. And so it, it's it's very vast also. Like it's not just one method that we use here. Again, as Jing uh, uh, and Rapana mentioned, it depends on which therapeutic area you are. And again, in oncology, it's mostly like survival that we look at. Thank you so much. Uh, so now it's actually time. Do your the speakers have about five to ten minutes to take some other questions, or do we just stop it right here? I do. Um, I can maybe take five minutes top, but, but I have to leave to to another meeting. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, so this question is directly for Dr. Mushte. It says that SAS validates their software IQ or QPQ, but R doesn't. How does the future of R look with respect to submissions to the FDA? Okay, so so right now, I'm sure that all all the R programs and R R modules that are being developed, especially to handle the new methodologies that are coming in, we cannot say no. <laughs> we are started accepting those uh, modules and trying to do our own research into how these modules are being developed. We don't just accept it on the face of it. We go into the code, we see like what's being done there, if there are any issues um, or if there are any strong assumptions that are being made um, that we need to be aware of or be taken care of. So yes, first, some uh, new methodologies we do accept are, but again, if you say like some survival ana analysis, like in one of the NDA submission, they're just like doing this uh, log rank test and doing present in this hazard issues, then typically we do want to um, ask the pharma statisticians to develop the code in R. Um, having said that, most of our recent reviewers that are coming on board, they come with the background of R, not, not specifically like with SAS. So we ask them to get used to SAS also because that's what we see in the submissions. And especially if we have to match like decimal to decimal, that's where the both the softwares differ slightly. Um, yeah, R does have a like, definitely like a bright future <laughs> there. We started like looking into um, our modules, definitely. All right, thank you so much. Uh, another question for you all, uh, and you can go in any order, is that uh, uh, this person says, I have a master's in statistics, 15 plus years of the, in data science, not in pharma. How do I get any response to my job applications? And I think the, Dr. Yi, you talked about how data scientists are needed in the pharma. 
Right. Uh, for company, for specific company like ours, uh, we typically will have our um, application portal uh, for for career, and then you can uh, screen through the different openings and then apply over there. And then I think I would encourage many of the students here, if you know any connections, reach out directly to the hiring manager. That's actually can increase your chance to be uh, given opportunity to talk to. Um, you know, being interviewed for that position more than, um, you know, just purely from applying online through a portal, because th those are typically pre-screened by our um, HR department, the human resource department, that may not necessarily get into the hiring manager's, um, you know, desk. So, um, you know, that can increase the chance. Um, but then that typically is what opens up within the company. Uh, that's how you actually apply. Thank you, Dr. Yi. Uh, Dr. Anderson, you have a, uh, there's a question about what strategies would you suggest to communicate statistical methodologies to collaborators not having statistical background? Yes, I mean, I think that the, the, the way that statisticians are most effective is when they understand the, the question. And the question is usually not a pure statistical question. The question is a scientific question, whether it's a, a clinical question or a biomarker question. So, you know, effective statisticians have to sort of take themselves outside of the technical work of what we do to understand the, the question. And so when there's a method that's applied to address that question, it's taking it back to the application itself. And I think that's the key to, um, to, to, to communicating to non-statistician, you know, the, the, the limitations or, you know, the assumptions, things like that, that tie back to the application. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. And I think our last question is for Dr. Mushti, which says, do FDA hire only US citizens and green card holders? If FDA opens to hiring immigrants, does it support with work visas? The policies, I should say, have been changing like over the time. Um, probably like a three or four years ago, we have asked only for US citizens. And again, um, it changed later on that we are accepting even with non-immigrant status also. As I mentioned, the title might differ based on the immigration status. Otherwise, the responsibilities are pretty much the same. So Thank look you. for those announcements sometimes, like if they specifically say um, if they require citizenship or not, that should like guide you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's 2.05, yeah, it's the time. So uh, those are all the questions we can take. I want to respect everyone's time, especially our speakers. Uh, David, so, can I yeah. just jump in and mention, because um, I did get a question just to me, but I think it's to the benefit of the whole group on yes. internship opportunities. Um, I, I, if people aren't aware of the SIBS program, the Summer Institute in Biostatistics, that's a wonderful program. There are some universities that participate that focus in on data science and others focus more on, you know, more of the you know, statistical applications, real world data, electronic health, that sort of thing. Different universities have participated in different summers. But it's it's NIH. It's actually NHLBI, I think, funded, um, and it pays for you know uh, everything, right? Travel expenses. They had to do it virtually the last couple summers, I think. But please look into that, and I'm happy to provide the link to everybody. I provided it just to one person, but I'll provide it to the whole group through the chat right now. Thank you, Dr. Henderson. Uh, so I think that's all. This is where we're going to start for today. I really appreciate all of our speakers, Dr. Yi, Dr. Mushki, and Dr. Anderson, and everyone who's able to join. Uh, we hope we can have more of this again in the future. I hope you all have a good one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.